I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. I promised you I'd do some value guys, and we already did the growth guy. So the growth guy, hedge fund guys, all three of these guys are. I'm excited to get into, you know, again, you can have whatever it is that you do. You can be value, you can be momentum, you can be growth, you can be a uh, quad guy like me. You can do whatever you want. The best thing, though, for us is to understand how people do it, okay? What is their process? How do they approach ideas? How do they get to ideas? You asked some great questions in the, uh, in the last presentation with Mark Shatton, or the last conversation rather, and hopefully you can continue to pound those into the queue because these guys uh, are very good at what they do and they can answer ostensibly any question you have about their process. So I'd like to welcome uh, both Chris DeMuth and, um, and Andrew Walker, who you guys run Rangely Capital. Uh, people probably remember you from if they were a Hedge Eye TV addict uh, from watching you guys present on, um, on MSG. Uh, yep. It was a great call. Madison Square Garden, for those of you that don't know, uh, Knicks Rangers. I think that did they ultimately do what you guys said that they were going to do? They're, this? they're in the process of doing a spinoff uh, that should be completed sometime this year. But yeah, about nine months after we came on, they announced they were going to do a spinoff, and this stock's done well since then. That's awesome. That's, uh, you know, that was, uh, I'm a Rangers fan, so I don't, I don't know if that helps me or hurts me. I, I just want them to make the team better. You know, they, it, <laughs> it might lead to them selling the team. So hopefully that can't hurt, right? Yeah. A new owner coming What do you in. think that Rangers are worth? Uh, Rangers are definitely worth over $2 billion, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, they're the most valuable team in hockey. You know, they're in the best market. They're one of the original six. That would be worth over $2 billion. And the Knicks, Dolan just gave an interview with ESPN where he said he's got an offers for $5 billion or over. I think $5 billion might be on the high end of what they're worth. But it, I think they'd be worth a pretty big premium to uh, Forbes values Rangers at $2 billion, Knicks at $3.6. Yeah, those worth are pretty safe premium. valuations. I mean, oh, I, most teams go for a premium. And when you talk about trophy teams like the Knicks and the Rangers, yeah. they, they would go for huge premiums. <laughs> well, it's a good thing Dolan's like laying low these days, so nobody has to worry about uh, uh, dealing with him in any transaction. <laughs> well, you know, if he wants to be a hero in New York, all he's got to do is sell the teams, and he's going to go from villain to hero real quick. People will just be so glad to be rid of him. Yeah, that's. Uh, but uh, congrats on that. Great call. Thank um, you. I love those. It. And, and that's really, I want to get into that. Uh, but first, I want to get a little bit into your background and, and why you believe what you believe. I think, Chris, you've cited um, Greenblatt's book as one of your favorite books, or at least something that's, that's helped you along the way. Like, why do you believe that what you're doing is the right way to do it? Sure. Um, we're certainly within the value tradition, but I think if you look back over 100 years, there have been kind of eras and evolutions where something was a good idea at the time, but was very specific to that era. You know, kind of if you look at uh, Graham and Dodd in the 20s, 30s, 40s, if you look at the Buffett partnership, and then I think that Greenblatt's evolution really was the kind of event-driven corporate transaction aspect of value investing that was perfect for that time. Mm -hmm. And I think you just keep getting pushed deeper and deeper into the nooks and crannies of markets where uh, something would be uh, uh, riskless or very low risk at that era, but you couldn't necessarily replicate it in the same way. You could get inspired, you could get educated by looking at Buffett, Buffett partnership uh, letters, but you can't necessarily do the same thing, no. you know. Uh, and uh, so I think that Greenblatt was important to me at the time for really focusing on corporate transactions. And where we've taken that from here is looking at corporate transactions, certainly, where you have value, where you have some sort of corporate transaction, but also kind of trying to understand where would value be hidden? Where is there a reason why the price system fails? So that there's some kind of mispricing. So you're buying a dollar, you know, the kind of cliche value investing, buying a dollar for 50 cents. We want to buy a dollar for 50 cents with a plan on how we're going to get our dollar back. Mm -hmm. And part of that, I think, has evolved from Greenblatt type ideas of uh, spin-offs and other type, you know, arbitrage, uh, other type of transactions like that into really trying to understand and identify where there's an agency problem and where there's a constrained counterparty. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to bet me something uh, and you want to pit your judgment against mine, I will run away and hide from any prospect that you could <laughs> offer because you might be smarter than me, you might have worked harder, and you might be cheating. And even if you're only cheating 2 or 3% of the time, uh, I don't have any reason to think that my odds are better. I might work hard, I might be smart, but dollar weighted, capital is pretty smart and hardworking too. And so we're looking for something where there is a structural anomaly, uh, either from the management or from the investors. Like I, I'm interested in distressed investments. I'm super interested in, in distressed investors. 
with a fine investment That's a great where they point. have to buy yeah. or sell. Especially in this day and age because liquidity can be such an, uh, illiquidity can be such an asset to the, to the incremental buyer or the new buyer. Yeah. Because so many people are just strapped by the inability to get out. Absolutely. And you have these episodic non-trending moments of volatility in the market where like in December, you get wicked disconnects. Mm -hmm. Or somebody can just come in or not and, and, and make a move. Absolutely. And, and for me, uh, liquidity matters and volatility matters is something to manage. We need enough liquidity, but it's not something we're trying to maximize. We're trying to maximize our expected value. And oftentimes, we're just looking to be a counterparty for somebody who is just demanding liquidity right. and we're a service provider. But to be clear, your expected value is based on where your, your cost basis is. Mm -hmm. I mean, your expected value I means so if I take down the Russell 2000 by 27%, which it went from August 30th to December the 24th, yep. you know, that means that I probably, within the Russell or in the space that you live in, the small to mid-cap, mm -hmm space, I probably have prices that were 30, 40, 50, in some cases 60% off Absolutely. over a three month period. Absolutely. So do you feel like, is that a part of your game uh, today that is becoming a little bit more active than it had been historically? Because we do have these episodic clusters, yeah. non-trending cluster of, of volatility that provide these lower prices. Uh, certainly. And, and the thing that fits well, for, that suits me, is I'm kind of a frenetic researcher. I'm happy to spend a lot of time uh, doing work on individual names, right. and I don't have any particular standard for busyness in terms of trading or investing itself. So I can spend a lot of time just trying to understand a phenomenon, especially if it looks like it would be hard for the price system to reflect value, and then can kind of be assertive when uh, prices uh, disconnect. Yeah, well, the way I used to do it, I mean, I, I think that I, I used to be value with a catalyst. I don't know if this is yeah. what you would, uh, you know, if you'd agree as, as, as the definition of what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. um, but a guy that I worked with, a guy named, by the name of Harry Schwefel, who's at point seventy two now, mm -hmm. he and I would have a bunch of what we call just kind of baked cakes. You know, yeah. we'd done all the work, all the Qs and Ks. We'd, we'd had our view of these ideas. The only thing that was in disagreement was our entry price. Sure. So uh, how much of that, like how many uh, baked cakes do you have at any given time that you've done all the work and you're yeah. just waiting? Um, probably a few hundred, you know, out of, out of say, 70,000 securities or something. It's probably our universe is several hundred things really? that we're kind of okay. uh, conversant in. And then, you know, it gets uh, from, you know, hundreds of things to dozens of ideas that we're actively working on. And it's very... Uh, dynamic, right? I think that if you look at big institutional investors, one of the constraints they have tends to be on very mechanistic uh, sizing and liquidity rules, where we uh, try to size based on our original invested capital at risk. So we don't want to lose too much money. Risk is always a function of price, not of asset class. Mm -hmm. And then we will spend a hugely disproportionate amount of our time on just even a few ideas um, to get down there. But, but a lot of the things, you know, I think there's things that I think about uh, as, if not in our portfolio, in what we're working on, it's just size to zero. Mm -hmm. And then just on the baked cake idea, like a lot of it will be, hey, we're really interested in cable stocks, right? So mm -hmm. once you've done the, all the work on Charter, you know, going and getting up to speed on Comcast or Altice yep. or going and getting up to speed on the media companies that are connected to the cable universe, that takes a lot less time. So you, know, you can almost have one baked cake in the Charter idea, but then you've got kind of 10 or 20 half-baked cakes and things that are really connected to that as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we do ends up being, hey, you know, we looked at this pharma arbitrage opportunity a year ago. Now it's spinoff or its sister company yep. is getting bought out. Let's go take a look at that. And you've already got a big backlog of research done up on it. Yeah, Mark Shatton just talked about that in a different realm in terms of growth investing, mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. He was all about, it's all about doing the reps. Yep. You know, once you go through the full exercise of, of vetting a company, meeting with the company, talking to the company, you know, you, you know that company. That's been institutionalized as a success or a failure, but that is what time and space does for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an important point. Uh, but just to, just, to, just to define the process, it, it is event-driven with a catalyst, mm -hmm. or you have to have the catalyst or you don't? You, we don't have to have a Why don't you start and I'll, I'll hop in. It's certainly the uh, box that we're put in. And I'm comfortable event with Event Driven. Event Driven is a box, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. Style. When you, and when you listen to Event Driven uh, managers, they mean different things by that. Big time. Um, and I would say that um, if you have a certain amount of value that's analyzable, um, our demand for price uh, goes uh, becomes more and more demanding uh, with the uh, with the complexity in the event. So we could have something uh, where there is just the cleanest version possible. You know, say 
a tender offer with a very high level of certainty with a very short date where we have comfort and we have an asymmetric view on regulation, on, a, uh, on, on the shareholder behavior. There's something about the dynamics. Perhaps it was something we'd be perfectly fine owning anyways as a standalone. That would be the kind of thing where we would tolerate you know, 90 cents of the dollar, whereas something that is a soft catalyst, say, maybe even it's just in theory we think that there is a huge control premium there for going, that would be something that we literally would need, you know, 50 cents or 60 cents. Yeah, a but it's event-driven, that's why people put it in a box. For those of you that don't know what event-driven is, it was originally, I mean, the guys that I used to work with at Magnetar Capital, we had an entire event-driven desk, but those were largely born out of, like, merger ARB desks. And yeah. That would be classic definition uh, which Chris just you know alluded to, where there's a defined event with a, ti- a defined timeline and a potential price you know uh, price gap relative to what and, you might think. And, but some of our stuff can be kind of pre-event where we think there's an event possible. Mm-hmm. So Chris alluded to, if we're getting 50 cents on the dollar, you know we might start dreaming up, hey, what are potential events that would make sense that the company might use to unlock that? Right. So yeah. like MSG is a good example. I was exactly going to go there. MSG, they own the Knicks and the Rangers, and we can do the math and say the Knicks and the Rangers alone are worth more than today's share price. And we get MSG, we get all their cash, we get a bunch of other things thrown in for free. Yep. What's do, Let's look at the history of this management team. Do they have a history of unlocking value? How could they unlock value? Is there a path to unlocking value? So okay. in that case, we thought there was a spinoff. We even came in here and said, hey, they might spin <laughs> these teams off. And nine months later, they say, we're going to spin the, these teams but off. But that's the more that's like how Harry and I would talk about. We, we call value the catalyst. We didn't yeah. put ourselves in any yeah. box. And we would just say, if they thought about it the way that we thought yeah. about it, mm-hmm. then that would be a catalyst. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of it is, and I think Chris will talk about this in a second, a lot of it is looking at management's incentives and saying, hey, you know, is this management team aligned? A lot of management teams, they're out there and they get paid based on how big the company is. They're not necessarily incentivized to create shareholder value. So a lot of it's going through the work, talking to management teams, going through the proxy and saying, hey, how is this management team going to get paid? Are they aligned to create value for me or are they aligned to just grow the business at any cost and get paid higher salaries, higher bonuses just based on running a bigger company? (laughs) That would never happen. (laughs) Thinking back to the Greenblatt book, if you look at situations that are classic event-driven but are uh, liquid, well-followed, and especially uh, are kind of arithmetically hedgeable, so not so that you could really define it as something where you're taking market risk out, yep. I think that that feels very picked over to me. I think mm-hmm. that, that that was novel in an earlier part of Joel Greenblatt's career, and I think that's a hard class right now. And so I think where we're kind of pushed as markets get efficient, as more and more actors kind of are participating in that market, is into situations where there's some aspect of it where you're stuck with the risk, and we're happy to quantify the risk. We're happy to use sizing and research as defensive tools, yeah. not just arithmetic hedges. Uh, so, you know, perhaps there's a new security that is a foreign ADR that's going to become part of the consideration. Well, you have to decide if you want to own it. We're comfortable with that. We're not going to say this is riskless, this is something, this is an aspect where we're taking market risk out. We're just trying to research it, understand it, and size it accordingly. Mm-hmm. I had a, um, a hedge fund client here yesterday. He was kind of practicing on us. He's launching a new hedge fund. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he made the comment, he said, Value with a catalyst doesn't work unless you own your duration. Mm -hmm. He's like, the problem with value with a catalyst, and this is something I'm very familiar with, is that if you're trying to do it at a hedge fund platform or at what we would affectionately call a pod shop, you really don't own any duration. Mm -hmm. You're month to month, you're week to week. I mean, do you think that that's a competitive advantage? Do you do you own your duration? Can you own it for however long you want? Um, and is it a competitive advantage in terms of what you do? And would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, if you look at kind of categories of things that I think a lot about, there's some that are even a few days, even a few weeks. And if it's highly uh, based on uh, information, not judgment, it's frequently even a few days before something will be written up in the press. So something can be very short duration. On the long end, uh, demutualizations has been something over the last yep. decade that I spend a ton of my uh, energy on. Um, that's something that typically is a three-year process uh, simply before regulators allow you to look at a subsequent deal. And then 75% of those companies get sold in the fourth and the fifth year. Um, but that's kind of a half-decade process. And in in the last decade, it has been delayed somewhat by management teams that get 
somewhat entrenched. I mean, these tend to be the most lucrative jobs in a lot of small communities. Uh, they put their friends mm -hmm. on the board, and when it's time to sell, they've been doing so at a slower rate than usual. But, uh, you know, so it can be a few days, it can be half a decade. And uh, <laughs> we think about sizing as something where we want to be more and more exposed as price and value diverge. Yeah. And we're smaller and smaller when they converge and that happens at whatever pace it does. Although typically when a situation's kind of played out and resolved itself, uh, largely the price reflects value enough that, uh, that we're not stuck just holding an open Yeah, the, the day, let's just say Dolan gets five, six billion dollars for the mm -hmm. next, yeah. the day that that's sold, that stock is gonna reflect the value. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. not gonna, it may not perfectly reflect it, but it's certainly gonna reflect it a lot more than it did prior to you buying MSG stock. Sure. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's basically it, you have time and space. So you do own your duration, and yeah. that's, that's a big competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at either uh, your terms with your investors or the kind of culture you create around what you're doing by communication and having the right investors, uh, how much uh, duration you control is more than your counterparties. I yep. mean, and that's uh, crucial. And if you look at times where the market kind of is simultaneously demanding liquidity, uh, you simply need to have stronger hands, uh, and that's going to have some limits. Um, but I think that, that either you can have the right terms or you can simply have the right people who stick with you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this reflects to what you were saying in Q4. You know, December, towards the end of December, I think a lot of what you see markets are down. It's not just tax law selling at the end of December. I mean, people were getting ready to meet liquidations and meet mm -hmm. redemptions at the end of December. Yeah. So you see a lot of this kind of forced selling, whereas if you have strong investors and you know that you've got kind of cash, you can be putting money to work in those rocky times. Yeah. All right. Um, just to, uh, in the last session, I, 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 I attempted to anchor down his process, but you made the comment about looking for um, uh, companies with the agency problem, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, maybe of like, let's just kind of, I just, this shouldn't be pink, uh, but uh, actually let's do Pink's pink. fine. Yeah, yeah. it's pink. We pink's cool. Pink. Um, so we have agency problem, things mm -hmm. that from a process perspective um, uh, that you're looking for, what would be a couple other ones that you're looking for that are just block and tackle, rangely, you know, this is what, this is what I need to see. Bidding wars would be a classic one. Yeah, bidding wars. Uh, you know, particularly something where maybe the management team's incentivized to do one thing and it's in shareholders' best interest to do another. So, uh, you know, right now there's a uh, bidding war where Merck, not the pharma company, but the chemical company came in for Versum, VSM, and offered $48 per share. Versum was in a stock-for-stock -stock merger where, uh, with a Ingelity, which is another company, where the stock-for-stock -stock merger would be valued at 41 And they want to go through with the stock-for-stock -stock merger uh, I think partially because some of them are going to be able to keep board seats and keep jobs if they go through the stock for stock merger. Well, if you're a shareholder, you look at it and say, 48's a lot higher than 41. <laughs> like the 48's cash, the 41 stock. Why aren't we taking 48? But that's, a pro that's an example of something where there may be some incentive for the management team to do something that doesn't perfectly align with uh, shareholders. So that's more agency problems, but bidding wars can fall into that mm -hmm. example. And I think uh, in, in some of, uh, well, in your prior commentary, you've talked about uh, no historical comps being something that you're looking for. What is that? Absolutely. Mean? Yeah. And a MSG. So MSG is a publicly traded sports team for the most part. Yep. There are really only three or four publicly traded sports teams. That's very difficult for the market to get a hand on it. It's very quirky. You know, if you look at MSG's financials and you say, oh, these sports teams are throwing off 100 to $200 million in free cash flow for, per year, how do we justify a $5 billion valuation on them? You'd yep. say, you can't. But if you know sports teams well, you could say, oh, there's a lot of yeah. soft value in owning a sports team. You know, without a sports team, James Dolan is just another billionaire. But because <laughs> of a sports team, he's a borderline celebrity. Everyone in New York knows him or hates him. Uh, <laughs> or, so, or loves him. Or, or loves him. <laughs> But it, things like that where you look at one company and it's so unique, it's very difficult for most investors to go and get a value yeah. on it. You know, you can't slap a simple, oh, it's probably worth 15 times price to earnings. Yeah, those are always, I mean, the, the, the stock that you can't put on your sell side's coverage list mm -hmm. because it's just a squirrel. You exactly. Know, just, it is what, like but, actually, I'm Mario Gabelli. I had a great conversation similar to this uh, with him where he was pitching me um, BATRA. That, that's another so that's for like us. The Liberty, he was pitching Liberty me the Braves. A class of the Liberty yes. Braves. Right? Yes, Liberty yeah. Braves, which is one of the other three or four publicly traded sports teams out there. So, and you look at them and you can't justify the valuation until you realize it's a sports team. So do you, do, do, would you agree? Like he'd, he'd say that, I mean, he actually he was right on it. I'm just looking at the stock again. I think he was telling me to buy it in the low 20s. It's in the high 20s now. I mean, the market said that's, that's a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, but situations like that, 
you do actually need them to, to make the decision to monetize the assets within the asset. You need the decision, but for the Braves, you know, the great thing about a sports team or the Braves is they built up a huge real estate portion around, they use the Braves as the anchor to build up a huge real estate portion. And what you're starting to see is that real estate's developing and it's starting to throw off income. And, you know, when you put up office towers next to a baseball stadium, those office towers are going to be hugely valuable after you develop them. Mm, that's but, interesting. And the great thing about the Braves, it's, owned, it's controlled by John Malone and Greg McFay of Liberty. And you, if it's a Liberty entity, you can feel pretty <laughs> sure at some point they're probably going to try to monetize yeah, so it. In in this form. case, actually, in, in the case of Malone, you actually do have, uh, you know, history is your advantage because he monetizes everything. Yes, and <laughs> you don't have the agency problem. You actually have an agency benefit where with some shareholders, they might want to hold on to that trophy asset. But at some point, you can feel pretty sure that the Liberty team, who's based out of Denver, they probably don't want to be in the business of owning an Atlanta sports team for the next 30 years. And who wants to live in Atlanta? <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually wouldn't like to live in Atlanta. I hope you don't take that personally. I'm from New Orleans, so I wouldn't want to live in yeah, Atlanta. People, I mean, people don't, I think there's not a hope in hell that anybody in, in uh, Fairfield County wants to live in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I would not take, uh, would not take any offense to that, given that that's my hometown. Um, maybe, a good, maybe a good spot, guys, to um, kind of jump into some ideas. Like you've already met, we've already talked about a, co a couple companies, uh, but I just kind of open it up to you on, on, a, on, on anything that you're working on that you want to you talk about. You mentioned bank. You want to start with banks? Sure. I mean, I think if you look at uh, consolidation, uh, one of the areas that we're very interested in this year is small banks and thrifts. So we have... Small cap? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, that, um, that historically, uh, w one of the areas that's interesting to us, one of the kind of corporate transactions has been demutualizations, so uh, mutuals, credit unions, uh, thrifts that change charters. Um, it's uh, something that is hard to do by hand. You know, when we talk about no history, it's not uh, that there's, there's no history. It's history that we need to go and do by hand as opposed to something that screens well and easily on Bloomberg, which I think is a good proxy for probably priced in about, you know, that maybe when Bloomberg first came out, that would be a tool that in and of itself you could have an edge on, but there's no way that that kind of ecosystem is an edge within the market because it's so cap weighted in terms of the uh, size of the funds that have access to that. There's got to be something else. So uh, for us, one of the places we found something else is in small banks and thrifts um, where there is a huge control premium because uh, in M&A, a small bank is the easiest cost-saving target in the world, right? You know, one bank needs one accountant, two banks need one accountant, three banks. You can get them for the, you know, you have the branches, you have the deposits, um, and uh, the assets and liabilities, but the deposit value themselves has been a very good way recently to look at kind of where uh, deal prices would go. It's also um, how you define the exponential value or the, you know, the rising value uh, of a regional bank stock. It's just yes. size. And, and, and for uh, history in this, it's, you know, every few years, and we do not define ourselves as activists as much as owners uh, and uh, people who tend to have a business plan idea for our investments. So uh, while some of these started as uh, mutuals, uh, ended up going through the demutualization process, uh, we are not a bank holding company, so we'll right. have at most a 9.9% position. That'll very frequently be our position size in a small bank. Uh, we will look to that for something after the three-year moratorium to want a very good explanation if they're not going to sell in the fourth or fifth year. Now, the recent explanation is not a very good explanation. It is that in a lot of small towns, this is the best job you have by an order of magnitude, and especially a kind of a quirk to a low interest rate environment has been people, perhaps in their 50s and 60s, who have a very good salary and not a lot of savings, uh, that, that, um, that that salary is a bigger part of their economic life than they thought it would be towards the end of their Big career, <laughs> uh, when, you know, say if you saved a few million dollars at a close to zero riskless rate of return, you know, you're not getting a big yield on that portfolio necessarily. They want to keep those jobs, and the boards want to keep those jobs. And so, um, you know, we have situations where somebody will come in as an activist and say, hey, we have this big cash premium, you can get it right away, and the boards just look de dejected at this. This is the worst news they've heard. Um, and <laughs> so, they lose their jobs. Oh, they lose their jobs <laughs> um, and, uh, and don't own that much shares. So, so we, we um, have ones that tend to be um, you know, uh, uh, very undervalued uh, as standalones, something quirky about how they screen with a very specific catalyst. Okay. Um, so one example, small bank, uh, BNC Corp in, uh, in the Dakotas, uh, tickers BNCC, um, and a couple things that are quirky about it. Uh, the one is that 
in the region, it has a sensitivity, has a perceived sensitivity to oil and gas uh, that is a misperception. If you look at their uh, assets and liabilities, they actually have a very valuable deposit base in a region where there's strategic buyers that want to move, uh, but that they actually have some kind of very whale-heeled uh, kind of clientele that really uh, is um, doesn't have the liability that it's perceived to in the in the gas patch. That's why the stock bottomed in sixteen when you had you know oil yep. collapse effect. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, and and it had only barely survived the financial crisis, right? So in the in the, in the bigger term, uh, that this was uh, for a while it was a distressed bank, uh, got out of the distress, and uh, still has a I would say a concentrated shareholder base. Um, it's worth in the low 40s uh, to a strategic buyer. You know, if you look at it now, it, it, it had a horrible uh, fourth quarter of last year, traded under 20. Because oil was down 40%. The, 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 the book value looks like it's 22 right now, but it's probably closer to 23 to 24 really? okay. um, because of their, uh, if you look at the duration of their assets. Um, and uh, there is an activist called PL Capital. They're a large shareholder. They have board representation. They're both pushing for additional board representation presentation and a, a shareholder overture to hire a banker and find a buyer. What's interesting about this is sometimes when uh, somebody says they're looking at strategic alternatives, underlying those words, it can mean very different things. Sometimes it can mean you're desperate and it's really defining the uh, ask and it's totally unclear if there's a bid. In this case, there are very well-defined bids of strategic buyers who want to come in this area, who could, who themselves trade for say, you know, over uh, two times tangible book value, they could pay easily pay, you know, 175 uh, percent of tangible book value for this, which would be a huge premium from where it is now in the twenties. Because in the, if it's at 26, you said the book value is like 22, 23. Yeah, and it would it would get 40 in a deal. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, what's the market cap of this thing right now? It's just, tiny. It's tiny. You know, well, um, tiny is good. But there's a thousand of these too. I mean, that's that's the thing that makes it interesting for us is we can build up positions in these, and it, it's so easy uh, qu qualitatively to take out costs. I mean, it's not like you know if you look at all the reasons why people do M and A. Um, there's a lot of reasons on the revenue side that can be kind of BS. But the one thing you can always do is the most unsavory part from the perspective of the employees at Target, which is you can get rid of a lot of people, you can get rid of a lot of costs, and they can do that here. And yeah, some of the costs, you're starting to see, you know, we see an article in the Wall Street Journal, people love online banking, they love the, they love the being able to take a picture of a check and cash yeah. the check and everything. And developing that technology, it costs money. And mm -hmm. if you're a small, Hundred million, you know, billion under a billion in assets bank. That's a pretty significant technology investment. But if you roll four of these banks up, you can combine that scale and invest in the same technology. Yep. So, it, it, over the past five years, you've seen a lot of banks that are reluctant to sell, maybe because of this agency problem where they're getting paid really good salaries. But increasingly, there's a chance that they're going to look at the environment and say, "Oh my gosh, if we don't sell." then Bank of America is going to come in with a mobile app, and we're going to be losing all of our deposits to them simply because we can't keep up. So mm -hmm. I think that's a, another added incentive and a, another synergy, as Chris was talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. I mean, and, and these tiny banks, they should not exist. There should not be it's thousands a, of these well, things in separate corporation. But that's good. I mean, I just, just looked it up just to see what tiny is. I mean, it's literally less than $100 million in market yeah. cap. And it's, you know, this is where the, the opportunity is left. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no, my analyst, Josh Seiner, on the banks, mm -hmm. you know, he can't, he'd rather, you know, I don't know what he'd rather do probably retire than mm -hmm. try to make a call on Bank of America again. Right. But if I had Steiner like go start a fund and all he did was follow companies, mm -hmm. bank stocks that are under 100 million, mm -hmm. he would add a lot of value. Yeah. Like you know, he'd find a lot of opportunities. And this is, you know, the hedge fund community as you know, as you get into big cap only space, the returns have been abysmal at mm -hmm. best. And this is a really interesting strategy you guys have. I mean, I love the fact that these are tiny I mean, you have people that are watching this are also tiny. You know, yeah. like I'm tiny. I mean, I, I have no problem. As long as my analyst doesn't pick it up, I can go buy this stock too. Yeah. You know, so, because uh, that's our rules internally. We can't, I can't, uh, you know, personally own stocks that our analysts are talking about. But that's, uh, that's interesting. And you also had the, um, you know, the, the two of the, the non-small regionals just are, you know, decided to get married. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a bit of a calling card for the industry? Or is that just these guys were at the end of their rope? They're both... Not young men, yeah. um, and they got together most yeah. recently. No, that's an interesting way. And, and we don't look at the regionals as much, other than there are actually quite a few small banks started by entrepreneurs, kind of de novo banks that have been built up 
to very specifically fit the holes that the regionals want. Right. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there are um, some of our positions are ones where uh, they're uh, going to be targets of the regionals. Now, one of the things we have to look for is when we're kind of thinking about logical buyers, it's hard to do multiple deals at the same time. Yep. So a lot of our timeline is really dictated by when the bigger banks are free from a regulatory perspective and from the perspective of their current deals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, cool. Uh, maybe a, a sports media cable idea? Yeah, like that? so one place we've really invested in, uh, spent a lot of time, is actually in the cable companies. Yep. And you know, there's this huge, I think overarching people will worry about the cable companies. They look and say, oh, cord cutting, like isn't cord cutting going to be a disaster for them? But when you look at the cable companies, you know, if you pay $100 per month for the video services, almost all of that money is going to the Disney's, the ESPN's, yep. the Foxes of the world. What's really profitable for the cable companies is actually providing broadband. So uh, you know, our favorite cable company is Charter, which provides this broadband. We think that's a utility-like service where they have huge pricing power going forward. And then the reason Charter kind of fits into our overall framework is Charter just bought Time Warner Cable and Bright, Brad House Networks uh, in late 2015. Mm -hmm. So when you look at their trailing financials, they're, they're an absolute mess because they're covered in integration costs. They've put in huge capex to upgrade all of their networks. But if you look at their forward financials and you say, hey, what happens if these guys can get their uh, metrics worth anything like a good, a really well-run cable company, which most people think Tom Rutledge is probably the best cable CEO out there, maybe you know one of the two best CEOs. What if they can get close to that? So you start running the comps to oh, if they can get close to that, I'm probably buying this growing utility at 10 to 12 times uh, free cash flow looking forward. Is that and, what it trades? Yeah, it's huh. really cheap once you start adjusting, taking out all these integration payments. And you even saw this at the beginning of the year. You know. Last year, they spent nine to ten billion dollars in capex. Wow. They come out in two thousand fourteen, uh, in two thousand eighteen earnings, and they say, "Hey, two thousand nineteen, we're going to spend seven billion dollars in capex." So our capital intensity is actually going down, and the stock takes off because people start saying, "Oh, the financials are getting clearer. You can start running the math really easily on how cheaply this trades." And then, you know, we're smaller, so we don't actually buy it through charter. We invest in this through the holding companies, Liberty, Bro Liberty Broadband, and Glibo, which John Malone, going back to him. They, they actually give you an opportunity to invest in Charter at a 10 to 15% discount by buying through these holding companies and tracking stocks. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that part. I mean, this thing has gone through, as you said, many, many iterations over the years. It, it's gone through. But, you know, when you look going forward, people's data usage, they, the cable companies say it on all their calls. It's growing 30 to 40% per year, all the data we use. You think about all the additional products that we're putting into our houses that are connected to Wi-Fi. I mean, it's an increasingly important part of your, yeah. your life, and they've just got such huge pricing power and such a long runway for growth because they're monopolies. Are there any, I mean, since cable's such a, a game of scale, are there any smaller cap ways to play? Any yeah, so there are a couple. So there's Cable One, which is really rural, uh, which rural is cable, yeah. rural cable in uh, some poorer communities, particularly in the southeast. But uh, that, that, it's actually really interesting because the huge bear case for cable has been what happens when people cut the video cord? And Cable One about seven years ago decided, hey, we make no money on video. Let's just cut video. We'll tell all of our subscribers, <laughs> go get your video from Netflix and Hulu, and we'll just provide broadband. And yeah. we'll, you know, we'll price broadband as a standalone product. And Cable One has made a massive amount of profits have from you this. Guys, have you guys own this stock? Okay, unfortunately, not enough of Cable Man, One. Man, that sucker yeah. ripped. And it actually trades at a premium to all of the uh, to all of the larger cable companies mm -hmm. because Cable One's ran out in front, and they've gone with their broadband-only thing. So they just spew off free cash flow, and it trades at a premium because of that. And I think people might think eventually it's an acquisition target, but it's really they've got better economics because they've cut out the legacy video. Product. Is that even possible for a charter to do that? To cut out the video product completely? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you just say, hey, uh, we're not going to offer video. You get your broadband from us. Comcast is even starting to do this, where they say, hey, our X1 product, you can buy video from us, but we really want it to be a platform, right? You can get Netflix from it. You can go get Hulu from it. Mm -hmm. So they can become a platform if they want, but the real core is in the broadband. With this stock, for those of you who haven't looked it up, the ticker's Cabo. Um, I mean, it's been a two-bagger. Yep. And it's just been a It was spun out of Graham Holdings, which used to be the Washington Post. They yep. sold the Washington Post. But yeah, they've had a really shareholder focus. They've focused on free cash flow. They've cut out video. You know, the big argument for video is the big cable companies, they say, we don't really make a lot of money on it, but we think it helps us reduce churn when we sell multiple products to people. Yep. Cable One said, we don't think people care. We think all they care about is the broadband. You know, they're going to have broadband in their houses. And so far, I think they've been proven correct. Mm -hmm. You can look at the stock. Well, I mean, it's, it's just like any value story. I mean, if you want to show me value, show me the free cash flow. Mm -hmm. And if you unlock a bunch of free cash flow, then I'm going to put a bigger multiple on that. If you're a value with a catalyst situation where the company still thinks they're a growth company, yep. and they spend $10 billion in CapEx after the spending the 8 to 9, then I'm not going to give you a multiple. 
So that's, I mean, it's, 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 they're actually trivial actions that these companies are taking that are, that are seemingly rational to the free cash flow buyer. Uh, or, or, or one who would put a higher multiple on a higher level of free cash. But I just think the Cable One story, you know, five to seven years ago, it, it was it was really uh, contradictory or contrarian for them to go out and say we really don't need video. People even today, most people you say cable and they think of their legacy video product. Mm. And a lot of investors, when we say cable is our biggest thing, they say, what about uh, cord cutting? We say, look at Cable One. We don't think cord cutting in the long term yeah. really has an impact on the stock. What really matters is broadband, their pricing power, and their penetration. Well, this broadband. gets back to what you're saying. It's it's the same. It's not not a metaphor, it's just a reality. I mean, these companies are just trying to get the executives paid and not rock the boat or make some kind of a career ending type move like that could have been. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to go one of two ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stock's either going down a lot or it's going up a lot. And actually, Cabo went up a lot. And I, I guess the other thing is, you know, it's cable, it's an infrastructure. If they make the wrong call on video and they say, hey, we're cutting video, and two years later they say, oh my God, our subscribers are fleeing in droves to go buy DSL from ATT and get direct TV beam to their homes, you fire the CEO and you bring in a new CEO and the first thing the CEO says is, we're going to get a video product out there, right? <laughs> so it's somewhat reversible too, but they looked at the economics, they really thought long and hard about it, and they said all of our values in this high margin, high free cash flow broadband products. So Yeah, that's good. Um, so if you have questions, just pop them in the queue uh, on any of these names that they've talked about, obviously. If you have specific questions, do you guys mind me jumping into a couple of them? No, not at all. Um, uh, some of the parts, what's your high end, some of the parts estimate on MSG uh, you know, at this point? Yeah, so... It'd be over. And he four. called himself Jim Dolan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, you would know better than me. <laughs> it might be Jim. I, you know, I, mean, I, I can't confirm or deny that Jim is a happy subscriber of Hedge. <laughs> on the high end, you can start getting close to five hundred dollars per share. On the high end, it's really going to start. Uh, mattering. So they own MSG Arena and they also have the air rights above MSG. The question starts to become if you're really going into a poll case, you know, can they get paid for those air rights? Can they do something inter interesting around that? Like and what? Uh, can they sell them off to Vernado, who owns all the buildings around there? Can they sell those off? Could they build something on top of MSG? Probably not. Probably not. But you start thinking, can they swap those air rights for rights to a bigger piece of land somewhere else where they can go buy a new arena? There's a lot of interesting optionality around right. those air rights. And then you start thinking, how big of a premium are particularly the Knicks, which are you know probably twice as valuable as the Rangers? How big of a premium would the Knicks go? You know, there are just. If I think they're going to go for $5 billion, there are only so many people who can write a check for $5 billion in cash. You know, you're know, you limited in how much debt you can take on when you buy an NBA team. So how big of a premium, how intense would the bidding war for the Knicks go if they were actually put on the market? I actually think it would be pretty intense because it's New York, it's the center of the it's the center of the universe, and if the Knicks are for sale, you know they haven't been for sale in decades. You, it's, it's, you've got one shot at buying. It's, these it's a really interesting one, and it, most importantly, it's the center of the universe for those who think they are the center. of Yes, the exactly. With the money, um, so that would be like such a you know. Well, look what happened with uh, the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number was you know gargantuan relative to initial es estimates, and the way that they did it was like a club deal. And the one we really look at is you look at what happens with the Clippers. At the time, I think Ford's valuation was in the six hundred million, and it's L.A. The second Second biggest market. The Clippers go for sale. People are saying, "Oh, maybe they'll get a billion. Steve Ballmer buy, uh, bids two billion, and there were multiple groups that were in the 1.4, 1.5 billion range. And that's because it's LA. There are a bunch of celebrities and rich people who live out in LA. They want that. They want to buy that team in New York. You know, and think Steve Ballmer wants to be at the center of the LA universe. And you're the savior of the Clippers, right? You buy it from the the awful owner. You buy it from Sterling. With the Knicks, you're the savior. Go ahead. He probably man. preferred to pay two billion dollars than a billion dollars. I mean, he was. It was probably just kind of a snob. Good. This is something that <laughs> you can buy in that increment. And uh, 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 that again. I, I don't know if you prefer two billion over one billion, but you know, one of the things is people look at that and they say, "Oh, we paid two billion, and the Forbes value was six hundred million, and other people were bidding one point five. What an overpay!" And the thing they forget is. He can write off all of that value yep. over 15 years. You get a huge tax oh, write-off when that. you buy yeah. it. Yeah, we, so, we, I bought, uh, you probably don't know this, but uh, just in, in, in case you care. Daryl and I talked to Yeah, yeah we but, bought the Phoenix Coyotes. So I'm yeah. part of the ownership group that bought the Coyotes. The benefits that one who has other businesses has in owning a professional sports team, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're manifest yes. relative to what I thought. Yes. <laughs> and again, that's why people, you know, the, the, these, these people aren't looking at the actual multiple cash flows Certainly, given that most of these teams don't even have a, a genuine stream of cash flow that one in the public markets would and, consider. And you bought yeah. the Coyotes, which are out in Arizona, so I'm sure there's limited synergies kind of with your business. But you think about a private equity titan who buys the who buys the Knicks in New York, right? 
every person who wants to, every deal they do, they say, hey, come to my court seats for the Knicks. You know, anybody's in town, they want court seats or they want box tickets. They're going to be their first phone call. There's so many soft synergies in terms of political power, in terms of deal making that come oh, along God. with buying one of these teams, particularly in a trophy city like uh, New York. Oh, my Lord. Big time. Uh, all right. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the consolidation trend within the asset management business of these of these smaller banks, uh, the oak, tr oak tree transaction comes to mind uh, specifically. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in there. I, I mean, oak tree is not a small bank, but uh, <laughs> one of our larger positions is the asset managers, particularly the alternative asset managers, specifically right. uh, BAM and KKR. And yep. BAM last week just bought oak tree and they bought it for 20 times earnings plus book value. And, uh, you know, I think going forward, if you look at it, if you're a, if you're a pension fund and you're allocating money, you want to write that check to one of the six or seven big uh, private equity funds. So BAM, uh, KKR, Carlisle, Apollo. And that's gonna, that has huge implications. If you're one of these mid-tier private equity firms or alternative asset managers, you're probably going to need to sell at some point, both for succession. You know, if you, if you lose your Christum youth, uh, and you're a solo, solo shop, all your LPs are going to flee. But if you lose your crystal youth and you're owned by BAM, uh, you can probably manage that internal succession and keep your LPs. Uh, so I think we'll see succession there. Mm, that's an interesting one. I guess they know these guys that are asking the questions know who you guys are. Um, yeah, let's see here. Chris and Andrew, uh, what's your big, what was your biggest success? And, and similarly, somebody also wants to know what your, what's been your biggest mistake. Um, I, say, I think they're talking about stocks. Like. Sure. Um, uh, biggest mistake has probably been getting stuck in these banks while we're waiting for sale processes that we never were really looking to become activists in. Um, and Because uh, you're so big now. You're... Uh, you, you, even in a small bank, you become illiquidly <laughs> large as a percentage. And yeah. frequently, if you're in via demutualization, you know you write a single check for your positions. You're not going in via the public markets. Um, so that's been a kind of sizing problem and mostly a waiting problem and a patience problem. Mm -hmm. um, these are not uh, entertaining. These are, this is less than, this is not uh, taking uh, your clients to the next amount of entertainment and uh, owning these things. And uh, just the kind of dreary aspect of trying to encourage recalcitrant uh, bankers and their boards to sell. Some so the, successes and some failures but, along so the way. So the lesson, the one delay. would say, like, people always want a lesson from a mm -hmm. mistake. The mistake is one that you're currently holding. Things um, take longer than you expect. There, but, there's, in, in, no matter how um, well you've thought about timing, there's typically dozens of reasons why something's going to take much longer than you think, and yep. not that many reasons for them to be faster. Do you think that that's going to be from here? Do you think it's going to take much longer, or do you even know? Oof. I, I think that the I think the current very low interest rate environment has had a big impact on management behavior. Um, yep. I think that there is a certain uh, corporate defense to smallness because mm -hmm. it's hard to pay for uh, proxy battles and. Lawyers, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when you have a very small position. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I, uh, people are asking for. By the way, by the way, the symbol on that on on that bank is B N C C. Yeah. Boy, Nancy, Charlie, <coughs> Charlie, excuse Charlie. Me. You know, I, I think another big mistake. You do this for. I, I've run my fund for three and a half years. Chris has run it for about 10, 11 years, and uh, sometimes you'll get. <laughs> you know, there used to be the black edge checks, which is the stuff of billions where people have inside information. But sometimes you'll get on the phone and you'll talk to someone about something or and you'll just have a really unique insight and you call up a company and they, they're like, yeah, that we've never thought about it that way. Or they sound so confident in a vote coming up that uh, you're – they sound so confident in a boat or something happening, and you've just got this really unique insight. And I think uh, it's really easy to undersize when you have something really unique, really edgy, really actionable. I think really mm -hmm. you know, those opportunities come along once a year, once every two years or something. I think really swinging, uh, really swinging the bat when you've got something unique like that is mm -hmm. something we've undersized and we work on making sure that we take advantage of fully when we have that. Awesome. Now, uh, what, what's, been, what's actually been your biggest home run? What's been our biggest MSG has been a pretty a pretty big uh, one. You know, it was over ten percent of the fund, and it's up pretty nicely. I think that would be uh, you get a ten percent position. Yeah, but that's typical of you guys. You guys take these massive positions. Right? We we take pretty concentrated swings. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. We take pretty concentrated swings on, particularly again when we think we've got some differentiated type view. That was um, that was the other comment in this meeting. Not that yesterday's meeting means everything, but uh, he is pitching, you know, through his Goldman as his prime broker, and he's got this whole pitch on how being your old school value guy doesn't work unless you have a, like I mentioned, duration, but b, bigger bets. Yeah. And that's um, 
You agree with that? Yeah, I, I think so. So, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I think you could be a value investor by saying, hey, I'm going to buy 20 or 30 stocks that trade at six times, eight times price to earnings, and I'm going to do well. And now if you're trying to do that, that's been picked over by computers. Like that, that type of edge doesn't exist anymore. Now it's really about, as Chris said, doing the work, doing the math, finding something where you've got a differentiated view. And unfortunately, that takes a lot of work. That type of insight is pretty rare. And when you have that type of insight, you need to bet big. And, you know, you have to adjust it for risk reward. And one of the reasons we could do MSG is such a big position is because you could feel pretty confident, you know, at four billion market cap, a billion in cash, the Knicks and Rangers, you could do the math and feel pretty confident that over the long term, it was very difficult to see real material intrinsic value downside to when you were making that bet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, when I started in the business 20 years ago, uh, geez, I mean, I actually wrote my senior thesis at Yale on, on if what if Buffett incorporated a short selling strategy to all of his you know, value investing principles. Mm -hmm. um, the game has changed so much, I mean, in the, it, since 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, now, like you said, I mean, it's, it's no longer a secret that something is cheap. I mean, that, 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 that is, you know, I guess pre-internet, it would have been valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the only people that tell you what's cheap is people on CNBC that are calling up the ticker and looking at the PE on a, on a 12 month look back. Chris, I mean, Chris walked through it earlier, right? 80 years ago, it was Graham, and Graham was buying everything below book value. Who's buying everything below liquidation value? And unfortunately, the fact of the matter is, if you're looking for stuff below liquidation, value today, computers have looked at that. And anything that trades below liquidation value, it's probably trading below liquidation value for a reason. Like the management team is just, <laughs> they're dead set on lighting that money on fire for one reason or another. Yeah. And then, you know, 40 years ago, it was Buffett buying great companies, buying great companies at good prices. And unfortunately, the fact of the matter is there are hundreds of people out there who are looking to do exactly that, right? So today it's really about doing the work by hand and finding some value that you have a unique insight yeah. into. I mean, you gave us three different things that you'd be looking for. I mean, the agency problem, bidding wars, uh, no historical comparisons. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, yeah, I, th I think the best one-liner you had was that I'm not, I'm not looking for distressed situations. I'm looking for distressed investors. I mean, if we're about to enter, which I, it's, it's one of our big calls, is that we're about to enter the wrong side of a credit cycle, which, by the way, means we're going to actually have a distressed investment environment. Um, I, I fundamentally know that, and I don't have to believe this, that people are going to be illiquid in these securities and not able to get out. Uh, there are multiple hedge funds now um, that aren't like the two hedge funds that we've talked uh, to today, which are you know, long short growth, and in this case we're talking about um, you know, value with a catalyst, but there are credit hedge funds that don't have shorts. I mean, how the hell, is, I mean, what is a hedge fund that has no shorts? I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, all I know is that there's a lot of credit, and we just saw the peak of the cycle on both growth and earnings. So, you know, we're gonna, about to get into this place where you're probably going to see um, many more distressed investors um, and people that are liquid than we've seen in quite some time. These people actually don't believe uh, that we're going to have a trending widening of credit spreads. Um, and that's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a crazy thing. Uh, if you guys show slide 70 on the deck, just I want to get their reaction um, to credit spreads in terms of like historically, like if, you, if you're me, you come into this business in uh, 1998, 1999, actually flip up to slide 71 maybe guys. Um, I'm just gonna show you, I think it's, uh, yeah, slide 71, sorry for that. I mean, so you can see uh, here, credit spreads widen, okay? This is high yield spreads, high, high yield spreads when they're widening, they're going higher obviously. In, tw in 2016, you know, to your point, and it was even found its way into BNCC because it was perceived to be a North Dakota, you know, energy play. So you get a widening of credit spreads here. You're you're well over, you know, the average. The average being 500 mm -hmm. wide on high yield OAS. But back here in 2000, when earnings growth started to slow from its cycle peak, and you entered an earnings recession, credit spreads widened and stayed wide for two and a half years. There is no such thing as anyone your age, my age, or younger that knows that as their last decade of investing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist. People don't think there can be a credit cycle because they haven't had a credit cycle. And there's the most corporate credit in the history of corporate credit. So it's an interesting time where I, I think that maybe guys like you are sitting on the right end of, if you have 100 to 200 ideas mm -hmm. and you have no distress, again, distress for people watching, there is no distress when you're here and there certainly is none in here. This is called the 1990s and this is called 
you know, 10 quarters in a row of U.S. GDP accelerating with tax reform fully loaded uh, to the all-time highs in terms of the actual earnings of the S&P 500. I guess for us, and I have a comment, a question, I'll ask Chris what he thinks. For us, I mean, most of our stuff is event-driven. So if you're event-driven and you're looking at, you know, a, a tr classic merger arbitrage where it's going to close right. in three to six months and in general they've got committed financing for banks and everything, you're looking at that, you're getting your cash back. So you, you really don't worry about a macro call there. You've got that event catalyst. Most of our stuff is, we've talked about cable, we've talked about sports teams. Most of those are pretty, uh, pretty recession resistant, right? So we're always focused on the risk reward, and we're we're always are looking at exactly what you're saying. If we run into some type of recession, how does this perform? Yep. And because we're generally cons more conservative investors, the event stuff, the cable, the sports teams, you know, we actually we generally adjust for that by investing in more conservative stuff. Then I, I think in December 2018, it was the best time to actually be looking. Hey, let's go look at some more leverage stuff. Let's go look at some chemicals and stuff. But yeah. we, unfortunately, we, we didn't quite have time to really ramp up and do that work, but I think our strategy and how we really think about the world helps adjust for a lot of that. I don't know what you think. Um, looking at discounts right now, where I'd say there's something we've thought about a lot, but there's just been a null set for the last few years. Looking at this, you know, there could be a ripe opportunity because not only when credit has been cheap, but it's been cheap and stable for a long period yep. of time. If you look at products that are really designed for retail investors who tend to be almost exclusively retail, uh, focusing on uh, yield and not really doing a lot of work in terms of credit risk. When you have the big spikes like we had in 08 and 09, um, some of the products like uh, closed-end funds that focus on credit, uh, BDCs that get distressed. BDCs. And then one, one of the things that's interesting is if you look at leverage requirements that are based off of their equity prices, where you have retail investors that are just waiting for a distribution that gets cut off because the price is down, mm -hmm. uh, there can be just total chaos. Mm -hmm. And so that those are uh, the kind of things that we would look for kind of uh, as you get into the next part of the credit crisis. I, I have a question. So, I mean, I'm just looking at this and I see right now we're 406 basis point spread versus 510. But, you know, a true to your treasury is yielding 275 or 3 percent versus in March 2000, it was probably 6 percent. Yep. So if I thought about it like that, I mean, if you're thinking about a spread to what you're actually yielding in Treasury, aren't spreads wider now? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's still it's still you're always using it off the base rate. So we're mm -hmm. talking about sure. like we're talking about high yield OAS. So okay. yeah, yeah, the level you're you're right. It's from a different place, but the widening of spreads is is this looks like a cyclical reality of earnings. Actually, this just looks like a chart of earnings. As earnings accelerated to their all time highs in 1999, credit spreads get plowed to the lows. The next all time high, actually, it's not. It's if you actually go back a slide, guys, um, you can see that the actual peak S and P 500 earnings growth rate uh, in this most recent year was right in line, 24 and a half. Go back two more slides to, to the 2000. This is S&P 500, S&P earnings, 22.6, 24.5. If you go back to the 2000, 2001 slowdown, S&P 500 earnings peaked right on the screws at the peak of the GDP cycle as well. So what happens is, again, it's just basic. I mean, people's forward outlook is based on yesterday's cash flow stream and the growth rate embedded therein. So that rolls over, it slows to negative. When earnings go, went negative in Q, uh, Q1 of 2001 and stayed negative, for four quarters in a row, credit spreads widened and stayed wide. And just one interesting thing we look at here is, you know, we talk about valuations for the market all the time just as an overall backdrop, like I'm sure you're doing with macro. And we look at this and we say, well, the S&P 500 probably trades about 20 times earnings, right? And I, historically, that's a pretty high, high level. And obviously, you're talking if you think the recessions are coming, earnings are probably even dropping further than that. But we frequently see these infrastructure funds or these big funds there. You know, you see an MLP that trades for eight times in the market or 10 times EBITDA. It, it announces a sale at 15 times EBITDA to an infrastructure fund. And our question has kind of been, we're event guys. We're always looking for valuation data points or what the next event is. You know, if a, if, if a MLP is trading at 10x and selling all its assets at 15x, is that a sign that they're undervalued versus their private market value? Or is that a sign that there's just so much dry powder searching for, desperately for deals? I mean, it, it can be both, right? Yep. But it is really interesting that you see a lot of these companies, they're trading so cheaply versus where kind of their earnings should be based on these low interest rates. Yeah, I mean, it's we've redefined, you know, what an asset could be worth if the mm -hmm. seller is willing. And if the seller is willing with full control, I mean, the multiple, like you said, same exercise using mm -hmm. uh, the Knicks. What is the what is the price? Yep. It's whatever that person who needs to, to make it work is willing to pay. The, the, the other thing that's really relevant to what we do on the next part of the credit cycle is looking at the huge amount of private equity money that's putting money to work in, in M&A with contracts that can be more sensitive to what kind of loans they're getting than 
the market perceives. So looking at reverse breakup fees was one of the big issues in the financial crisis about which deals blew up. And mm-hmm. so that's kind of the kind of thing, looking at contract language and the game theory around how deals are put together to kind of think about what deals are going to break in the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, when deals start to break, then we're going to be in a totally different phase of, of what the market believes to be true on, a, on certainly on a two-year look back. So yeah. um, thank you for, uh, for your time. We're up uh, on the clock here, and I appreciate it. It was, a, it was really good to kind of get people aware. And again, I always talk about being macro aware, mm. but I think a lot of people that Actually, we have a lot of people watching this that only do macro. They're, they're, they're unaware of what guys like you, you do. So thanks for uh, explaining that in detail and explaining your process. No, thanks for having us.